Hi everybody, my name is Lubom and this is Ratio Talks, a series by the Ratio Podcast. Uh, in this series we do a wide variety of discussions with scientists and uh, interesting people from various fields and walks of life. Uh, we try to go in depth on a bunch of topics, mostly to do with the physical world. And our main focus is to um, show that there is a place for science and technology in a modern informational landscape. Today I'm speaking with uh, the illustrious Robin Inns. Robin is uh, an English comedian, he's an actor and writer. Uh, he's known for presenting in the BBC popular science series The Infinite Monkey Cage with the physicist Brian Cox. And he's also the winner of the Golden Rose and the Arthur C. Clarke Awards for Science Communication. Robin is an author of several books, including Am I a Joke to You? Bibliophile and the Importance of Being Curious. He was awarded Author of the Year by the Bookseller Association of UK in 2022 and he is an honorary fellow of the British Science Association. As you might have noticed throughout the episode, or actually you will be noticing throughout the episode, I'm an absolute fanboy of his and we go over an absurd amount of topics uh, together. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and uh, yeah, have a good episode. I don't know, I think this this is something we can probably discuss. I think the idea of uh, being perfectly informed about uh, everyday stuff, about the example I gave you with uh, with books, um, you know, trying to find out whether something is bullshit or not, or even uh, something that you've read and vouched for it, the idea that you could have some amount of uh, close to good quality knowledge about the truth of the matter, I think is approaching, um, I don't know, it's not bullshit, but it's, it's approaching an impossibility right now. I, th I don't think we can right now navigate such a complex uh, world. It seems kind of pessimistic, but I think it's useful to know that we're kind of fucked. We're kind of fucked and we cannot navigate it and we need different tools and maybe different ways of speaking in order to be able to manage this. And we need to be kind of honest about not being able to navigate this shit. Because end of the day, if you, um, if you continue going into this cycle of, uh, uh, yeah, here's this uh, new author, amazing claims, etc. And then somebody spends six months trying to debunk, debunk it and stuff begins to crystallize. I mean, there's no fucking way everybody can do it. No, and it's this also the strike that from the first headline, the headline is what sticks. So mm -hmm. it, it's that bit, you know, you know, know those kind of, uh, you know, procedural movies where they go, the uh, jury will ignore the, pre well, they, the jury can't ignore, the jury have heard it and it's kind of a very, yeah. but I, I, I think one thing is, do you, have you ever read Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death? No. It's great, right? Neil Postman, this was early 80s. And it's all about the fact, it, it's kind of, are we in an Orwellian world? Are we in a brave new world? Yeah. Are we in a mixture of them both? And one of the things that really stuck when I first read that book was where he said, you should cut down your opinions by a third. And I think now it's probably much higher than that because mm -hmm. there's so many. But I think that's part of the way that you get through it, which is you have to every now and again go, I have no opinion on this and I don't need to form one. Mm -hmm. So this story now gets ignored because it's not required. And that bit of – like I, when I was doing a tour for the Importance of Being Interested book, um, quite often I'd get asked a scientific question from the audience that – as if they if, as if I was a scientist. Mm. And I would say – I don't know. I don't know mm -hmm. that. And but I can tell you where you should go. You should. This YouTube channel has some great stuff, and and this this author, mm -hmm. uh, she's really good, and all of that kind of thing. And every time that I said I don't know, someone, at least one person, would come up to me afterwards and say, "Thank you very much for saying that you didn't know." Mm -hmm. Now that it shows one of the problems that we have, mm -hmm. which is to just say, oh, "I don't know," mm -hmm. uh, is considered to be a weakness by too many people yeah. so you know some of the questions i was asked i could have kind of rambled together mm. some explanation yeah 
but it wouldn't have come from a deep place of knowledge. So it was much better to say, go to this person. They've got they've got the deep knowledge. But I think you're right. That, that, that's part of the navigation. Part of the navigation is to say, I'm going to ignore this area of land and I'm going to ignore this area mm-hmm. of sea and I'm going to go down that route. And I'm also I'm lucky because I've got yeah. so many friends who, you know, if if a certain idea, if it's mooted, I think, shall I ring Helen Chersky? Shall I send an email to Jan Eleven? Shall, you know, Katie Mack or, you know, or, or, or Brian or whoever it yeah. might be? That's a serious portfolio. Yeah, that's the great <laughs> thing that I've got is, you know, I'll sometimes yeah. just be walking across a meadow and I have an idea for a joke, but it's got a scientific, and I'm like, nah, will that logically work for this joke about Star Trek? And I'm, bip, 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 bip. is that Jim Al-Khalili? Jim. And I always get to say, there's never, how are you? How's everything going? How are the family? It's like, here's the question. Let's see. <laughs> You know? <laughs> that's I mean to a degree that's something that I, I have with our organization because at this point we've we've had a bajillion people that visited events, podcasts, etc. Mm. I don't have the, the same approach to you because I don't walk on meadows. Uh but I mean more often than not I I have something that I've just figured out or just thought about and I'm like I need to I need to write to a physicist. Yeah, yeah, I need yeah. to just see what the fuck is this something is this you know it, it's, it's not like I have the most brilliant idea of something but rather it, it's something that just struck me as a connection and I want to share it with some people that could get, tell me if I'm bullshitting or if it's something that is maybe an interesting discussion. You see that's yeah. the interesting play is that that playing conversations is really I was saying this uh I can't remember it yesterday about When I used to do a regular Sunday science, science Q&A uh, during lockdown, and mm. we'd have three scientists on, it was myself and Helen Chersky, in fact, it's two scientists, well, three, including Helen, and she'd be on every week. Um, if we had someone who was a, predominantly a science communicator who'd, mm. who'd written a book but wasn't a scientist, I found out immediately that they were really wary of being playful with ideas because they had a narrow bit of knowledge that they were selling, mm. and they better not take the risk of revealing any form of ignorance in case that affected book sales. Hmm. Whereas I don't have that worry. You know, my like every uh one of the things that I found when I wrote Importance of Being Interested, I had to be very careful to make sure that I did not take things from an interview and turn them into the appearance of my knowledge. So I'd hmm. always as much as possible, I think I did it every time, I made sure that I didn't go, well I'll just get rid of the you know Brian Green from this bit and I'll say the universe is this, this and this. Hmm. Now I have to make sure that people also partly because I wanted to show people that you could approach these ideas ideas and if mm. i start pretending that i have a deep understanding of black holes that i don't have yeah. then it's like the illusion that i've created but that bit of not pretending to know when you don't know mm. and mm. sometimes it's just that we don't know but we didn't know that we didn't know and then we say something out loud and someone goes uh oh, you don't know anything about that <laughs> and then then being able to take that on and not be uh it's it's that i think that's another issue which is to you have to managing your ego is a really difficult thing in a world of knowledge yeah. that when someone tells you you're wrong i think very often the initial bit is oh, God, that's, i mean i'm just trying and you know and you get really that bit of going okay i'm wrong well that's good that's good yeah. because now by finding out that i'm wrong i'm now got i'm being put on another pathway and mm. that's much better but i think you know i think that's what to some extent i think that might be what's happened with joe rogan Hmm. I used to really like watching Joe Rogan's uh, podcast when he had scientists on. I thought hmm. he managed them very well. And, you know, Sean Carroll did them very regularly and stuff like that. He's but, a good host. Though, yeah. And then, but then he started – the, the I had not watched any of his political ones. Hmm. And I started to watch them. I was like, whoa. And then I started seeing some of the stuff that was moving towards conspiracy theory. Yeah. And then also sometimes things about sex and gender and, and cancel culture. And I thought – I think, and I might be entirely wrong about this, I think one of the things that happened was if, for instance, you want to be progressive, either in your knowledge or in terms of just being socially progressive, hmm. and you're my age, you will make mistakes. Hmm. And someone will explain about the way that you've used a pronoun or whatever it might be was not the right way of using it. Hmm. And then you have a choice. You have the choice of either going, uh, oh, thanks, with a little bit of you going, mm-hmm. or you go, oh, this is ridiculous. 
<laughs> and that means that you yeah because you have to if you you have to like I remember once I was doing a gig and I was talking about uh, uh, same sex marriage but I said gay yeah. marriage that night yeah. and uh, afterwards someone came up to me and said uh, oh by the way I think that routine it will be kind of better to say same sex mm-hmm. marriage than gay mm-hmm. marriage and the, I could hear that voice in my head go oh god I can't believe it I'm just trying to help and be really cool and then and then the other <laughs> side of it going well if you are just trying to help you have to listen and a friend of mine Lucy Nichol who wrote a, a really good yeah. book called Don't Call Me Snowflake and and she had the same thing she wrote a, a, a piece about addiction and someone picked her up on uh, a former addict said I kind of think this wording is and again she said her first reaction was hmm. but I'm just trying to help and then the second one is if you're just trying to help you have to listen Hmm. And you have to be prepared to be malleable and and go. Sometimes you might disagree. That's hmm. all. You don't have to immediately agree. You might go. But you know what? I don't think that is right. But quite often, I found in the initial. I mean, like I didn't really understand. Going back to the pronoun thing, like they them. Initially, when I started to hear they them, I was like, I was worried. I didn't mind, but I was worried. I, it, what do they mean? Does that that mean that they're, they're kind of more than one? Person, mm-hmm. I think that, and then it just became really simple. Once I eventually mm-hmm. properly had it explained to me and understood, it, it was like, oh yeah, it's ju- it's just removing the he she ness mm-hmm. from someone, that, and and that's or, or certainly in most cases it's yeah. removing the he. And it was like, okay, now I've got it. Now, now I understand. And then I was reading a piece by Ursula Le Guin, who's, who's one of my favourite authors. I think she was so fantastic, not just creating Earthsea and the dispossessed and all that, but she was also, you know, she's an, she's an anarchist thinker. She was a uh, very, very thoughtful human being. And she wrote a piece years ago saying, and this must have been the first kind of bit of they, them reaction. She said, well, actually, if you look in history, you go back 300 years and individuals were called they and them. Hmm. That is how, that was the simplest way of doing it. So this is not, in one way, though the, perhaps the ideology has changed within it, mm-hmm. it's, it's not an unusual thing. Huh. And it's not, it's not something that's worth being... You know that thing again where you go, is it worth being angry <laughs> about this? Is it, I've got a, I'm trying to ration my anger, and yeah. I want to have it ready for what I really need to be angry about. I don't know. I think... Uh, I'd, say, I'd say it's easy to say um, you needn't be an asshole uh, especially in the cases when, when you're wrong or when you're being corrected um, and it's easy to say that you should try to navigate away from your reaction based on your ego being slightly bruised etc but I think it's also a case of um, the way we communicate between each other in general so uh, it's also um in part of the responsibility of the person that's uh, applying the critique uh, to not be a jerk. Yeah. So, uh, that, because the means in which uh, you can uh, say something, correct somebody, etc., are pretty fucking wide. I mean, you can say a lot of hurtful shit without it being wrong. I mean, you can go and say, well, that wasn't very good because objective reasons and you know i didn't enjoy it because it was kind of shit you know you can be kind of a kind of a dick uh when you um attack somebody someone's performance Mm. and there's a line i don't know what the line is but i think it's still connected to um someone's identity and someone's stake in what he's doing so let's say you're a performer or doesn't matter um you um applied some amount of thought to the stuff that you want to share with people etc you you might have fucked up one Mm -hmm. or two places it's fine to be corrected but i don't know where is how we should navigate the correction of the corrections so as to have a healthy conversation yeah, I mean, I think that is important. But I also think there's another factor in that, which is sometimes you have to think, how much has, how many times has this person had to deal with this issue? Hmm. The moment someone yeah. is in the outside of the status quo, for us, it's one mistake we've made in terminology or whatever. Hmm. For them, it might be something that they have had to deal with 
for their whole life. Yeah, sure. You know, it's like, it, it's a, you know, everyone who would come up with that, yeah, but all lives matter, right? Which was, and also, sometimes people are very disingenuous when they uh, are, you know, they, they pretend it's coming. There, there's a great, what's, oh man, what's his name? Uh, Eddie Glaude, Eddie Glaude Jr., uh, who's a black writer, and he wrote, uh, or a writer of colour. I mean, even that, you know, that's an interesting thing, is, is hmm. I, I'm learning all the time, what are the, and, and when Trump got in, uh, it was like, as you can imagine, for a lot of American people, it was an existential, you know, the, the, the level of anxiety mm. of, oh, my God, this regression, this step backwards. And what he did was that he wrote, he suddenly realised that he, he listened to James Baldwin and he read everything James Baldwin wrote. And James Baldwin was such a great, you know, narrator of the world that he was in in terms of civil rights, but also what it was to be black in America and... Uh, and this helped him. This kind of saved him. Hmm. And I was interviewing him about his book, Begin Again, which is all about how James Baldwin was the voice that guided him through this incredible existential anxiety. And he said, one of the problems I have is when I'm, say, going on a, a TV or radio show to talk about critical race theory, I always have to pretend that the other person is arguing in good faith. Hmm. And I think that that really stuck with me, yeah. which is sometimes when people want to argue with you on the internet or whatever, I try and look at them and go, nah, I've just read enough now to know that this is not an argument that comes from good faith. This is an argument that comes from ideology and dogma. Hmm. And so I think that's an important part as well. So I think we have to factor in so many yeah. different things. And of course, it's a bit like smoking, where when you give up smoking, if you give up smoking, uh, but when I gave up, for the seventeenth time, and this time the most successful one so far, twelve years or whatever it is, and uh, um, someone said that the thing is that if you can get through the first nine seconds of urge, so when you suddenly go, oh man, I want a cigarette, and you're going to, uh, uh. oh, I don't anymore actually, and I think that's the same with anger and righteousness sometimes, mm. which is you go, oh. God, I can't believe this person. Tippity type, tippity type. Tip. Well, if you just go, I really cannot, but this is just ridiculous. One, two, nine. I leave it. And I think that bit of not allowing the, you know, allowing your frontal lobes, the very front of the frontal lobes to yeah. go, let's just have a quick discussion. You're right, this does not, all it does is it bre It doesn't even get rid of your anger. It's a bit like, you know, the research that was done, with, you, know, you know, at school when we were kind of, you know, going through games and all of that stuff and sports, it was always like, the great thing about rugby and football, especially rugby, is it really gets rid of your aggression. And actually all the research has shown it doesn't. It, it actually, after doing an aggressive game, argh, you've got even more. <laughs> so, you know, go to the library instead. Um, but I think, you know, that, and, and I think that is happening. We, we sometimes think I've let that anger out. But yeah. Maybe it begins to become an addiction. Yeah. What you said about, you know, having like a cool down, you know, just take nine seconds is perhaps the way I've thought about social media. I mean, most of the you open a random post about something about politics. It really doesn't matter what. It could be, you know, there's new types of signs on the street X. It could be as basic as this. And you can open the comments on Facebook and it's going to be a cesspool. It's going to be horrible. And you look at most of those com comments and you, at least I can't help but think, what if there was a cool down? What if, I mean, you... Uh, you could post under the thing, but you write your comments and then it gives you a time and says, you know, you have to wait for a bit. You can just, you know, you can correct this. this yeah, yeah. Post. You just look at it. And then you say, okay, post again after, let's say, half a minute or something. I'm curious whether all the comments will be the same. Yeah. Because it, most of them look like, ah, oh, fuck you. You know, just, just like a guttural reaction. It's not even content. It's mostly just some kind of uh, disgust by something that just gets gets a rep and then move forward with the next uh, topic. It's not even uh, an argument. It's mostly just a reaction, something emotional. Well, that's the thing, isn't it, about the social media that now identifies as X is uh, that it. this is why I would say it's something which actually has a proper like like facebook for and i won't get into the politics of it but the yep. advantage of facebook is 
a comment is made and then there is a full narrative underneath of all the people That's arguing right, yeah. whereas on uh you know the the twitter thing it's jab gone jab gone and and sometimes when you try and make up how did this narrative get to here it's very mm. hard to piece it all together yeah. whereas the bit that actually says this is now one page of argument mm. and you can see when it goes off the rails or whatever and i think mm. that that helps because otherwise you're, you're not taking very rarely does anyone take into account what the other person said or even listen and also it is the bit of what i think i found out most from from that kind of social media world was that the loss of nuance, the uh, loss of all the verbal cues, the loss mm. of tone is huge. And yes. you can find that someone is furious about it. And then you try and explain it. I used to do this all the time. I go, oh, no, I, I think you've misunderstood the, the, how dare you say I've misunderstood. Oh, God. And it would just get, it never got, very rarely got better. And that's, you know, so, and, and then every now and again, someone would go, oh, I'm so sorry. It's like when I said to you about when, when Neil Armstrong died and, mm. uh, I think one of the things that I put up was I don't even believe that we landed on the moon. As far mm. as I know, we projected a, a hologram from Mars onto the moon. And someone believed that I really was a conspiracy theorist who believed yeah. that we'd landed on the moon and created the equipment to project a hologram onto uh, uh, land on Mars and protect a hologram on, on the moon. And then once I went, oh, no, I'm really sorry. That was just me being kind of, and I do understand that the uh, the world of Twitter means that there's no reason that you might not believe that that was a true <laughs> statement. And the person was just like, oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry about that. And I went, oh, no, I'm sorry too. And, th and those moments, you remember those moments, the first moment of humanity that you would see during yeah. a, a, and it was like, and it felt like such a rare moment, didn't it? Hey, we both just backed down. Everyone was relaxed. Hey, calm down, everyone. It's all right. Yeah, isn't it? I think... Uh um, a lot of a lot of friends of mine would probably argue with this, but I think um, a a big loss in social media or in digital communication in general is specifically this nuance that you get just by the presence of somebody right in front of you. I mean, ninety percent of the horrible shit people write on the internet would just not be said face to face. It's just in, insanely to say some of those things. I mean, but that's what I don't drugs. understand is why <laughs> it's taken so many people to look like the um, Alam Shaha, who wrote a great book called uh, The Young Atheist Handbook, which is a very mm. beautiful book, actually, I think slightly badly marketed in a certain way, because it's really just mm. a, a, an autobiography of when his mother died and how he is someone who was brought up in, in, in a very kind of, you know, r religious environment, how that affected him. It's very beautifully written. Um, someone went to see us, uh, a speech he did, I think, at the Skeptics in the pub in Oxford mm. or whatever, and they wrote, I was very disappointed in at Alam Shahar's talk. And I got in contact with him and I said, um, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't include that person in this. He went, well, I'm just telling him. I said, but you're not telling him. If you'd started it at Alam Shahar, I have to admit, I was a bit disappointed in your talk or whatever, mm -hmm. then you're talking to him. If you just include it, in your general tweet it's like standing in a room and i know you're there and and going well i'll tell you one of the things that i think is really awful about ratio it's actually every time luba goes on stage it's terrible it's, and you can hear that's a different thing it's a different than thing. me approaching you and by the way i thoroughly enjoyed your appearance on stage so please Thank do not you. think that was uh, uh, but it is but it, it's all of those those bits and i think you're quite right to realize but uh, that's not just social media it's news media as mm. well i mean news media has such that there, there was a journalist a particularly awful journalist and I, I won't bother naming him but he used to write about a friend of mine who has done a certain amount of climate change activism within their stand-up and stuff like mm. that the most horrible things real ad hominem attacks but then at one of the elections there was one of those kind of events where the tv people have a bunch of people on a boat to go and how do you feel about how the election's going and this journalist saw my comedian friend and went straight over and went oh it's wonderful to see you oh everyone you must be he's, he's the greatest comedian he's such a funny person and this was all genuine mm. and it was like and that disingenuous thing which is yeah and, and i think in the whole or across the board it's like with politics sometimes there's politicians who who are, i'll say i think what they've done is so appalling and the way that they've dehumanized this or whatever and someone said yeah but have you ever actually met them and you go that doesn't count what how they behave to me hmm. in a social environment when we're having a glass of wine doesn't discount that they have said this about refugees, that they've tried to bring mm. in this policy there, that they've had this homophobia there, whatever it might be. And mm. that's the awkward thing about the fact that very often face-to-face, -face, we are on our best behaviour. Mm -hmm. And 
so yeah there's so many different that bit of who is and, and in fact last night I spent a lot of time when we were drinking and eating cheese you know talking about that the disparity between who you present yourself as and who you are inside and what your true beliefs are hmm. and I think if you can as much as possible try and make sure that your outside mind uh, your inside mind, rather, is what you are on the outside. And there will always be some disparity. There will always be thoughts that we would keep. But the the less of a, a divide between your internal and external, yeah. I think the more content you can be to to move through the world. And if you are able to express yourself and if you are able to decide, what do I want to say out loud? And mm. what am I happy saying? And what actually really represents my mind? It's something that you said specifically that... that just occurred to me that there might be a connection between let's say the politics of somebody that's been horrible in your opinion about x uh the journalist that does a hit piece on somebody or the random guy that posts on twitter and is an asshole by saying you know i hate this person in the room that i'm not talking to directly um Don't all those three things um, have like a, a common narrative in the sense that they are not genuine communication? Uh, they both, they, the three of them are some kind of a performative mm. uh, communication. So it's not the same like us talking right now or us corresponding directly like via messenger etc it's it's a performance because there's always an audience yeah for for the three cases and i think that's kind of a, the issue with social media to a degree as well because everybody gets an audience now and when you have an audience there's different things at stake there are different in incentives and that's when you can basically put on uh, a different mask, a different thing with which you can operate in the world. And I mean, I've I've known a bunch of people, some of them journalists, etc., which are exactly as you said. I mean, you meet them in person, you can literally um, have a drink, you know, talk about all the contentious politics that they have and you have and get to the nuance and mm. get to a pretty constructive discussion. But then you see a piece that they do on something where they structure it specifically as a hit piece. Mm. And you know those people. You, you know they are able to go uh, to the place that's actually productive from your point mm. of view. But they don't because that's the performance. That's the thing that they do. And I don't know how to rationalize this. I don't know if this is... I don't know if it's even wrong, by well, the way. Well, I think the thing is that... What is the action that creates the most damage, for instance? So this person who's got all that nuance, and then they go to the place where they really have a platform, and they deliver something that, for instance, will be incendiary, that will increase the amount of hate in the world. I mm. think that's quite an important, that's their most important action. Who they are when we're just having a drink in a bar, and all of that, that's fine. But when they have the power Mm -hmm. It's like when you see quite often with politicians, when you see them in opposition, yeah. they're great. And when they get into power, you go, why are they so rubbish? And when they leave power, you go, they're really cool now. Well, the important <laughs> bit was when they had power. So the important thing is, the important action is, what do you want to do with yeah. when your voice is most amplified? And I think there's different levels there. You have, like some of the people, say on social media, uh, it's you can see people who are just saying stuff because that's how they feel, and it's mm -hmm. nothing to do with money or, or ego particularly. Mm -hmm. Then you have the bit which becomes about ego and money. So because these things can be monetized, hmm. so I, 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 I would say that I might be wrong about this, but I think journalism might have gone downhill when it became important to be clickbaited. It became important that your piece went around. So if you write a piece that you know that's really going to anger liberals, and then you know that the liberals will rather foolishly go, I can't believe this piece. And you go, oh, you, you're now amplifying the piece. Ignore yeah. that piece. Go, yeah. You know, and I've made that mistake, and I know many people have made that mistake. And more often than not, what I try and do when I see those kind of things being amplified is I put up an entirely separate thing, which has no connection mm. to it, but is, is maybe still what's trending. 
So mm. I go, oh, I just read this brilliant thing. Or sometimes when I see people that I know who are being targeted with with hate and you see them trending, is I just put up, oh, I just saw this brilliant thing by uh, this woman. I think it's really fantastic. And then you think, if we all do that, mm. eventually you taint, change the trend from being a trend of, of hate, mm. but that is still amplifying the hate. But I think that's part of it, which is a lot of this is monetized. Mm. A lot of... Uh, conspiracy theories are monetized. A lot of people who are doing anti-vaxxer stuff, there are people who this really does feed their mm. bank account. And that disingenuity doesn't then, we should not then go, oh, they're actually okay because they don't believe in any of that. Yeah. They, they've used their platform for the worst. So, so I think it is about mm. when you're talking one-to-one -one someone, that means one thing. But if you see what they're doing when they're talking to 20,000 people or 20 mm. million people, that's the bit that counts that bit is all you know that bit you go right that really is you know uh, uh, uh 20 million to one asshole no that's the wrong stats but you know what i mean <laughs> let me let me try and make a step back because i think there's, there's no a, there's this is exactly what happens every single time and i will yeah sorry yeah there's a further I nuance just we'd make a moment there. there's a further nuance that fuck uh, you and your nuance yeah sorry <laughs> i i greatly enjoy our talks <laughs> um, <laughs> Because I think it's easy to go to the um, uh, edge cases where, well, it's a shit show, where somebody is deliberately, um, you know, putting words in somebody's mouth, uh, doing some kind of disinformation, just, just being a horrible fucking person. But I think what, when we step back, we see that the instrument that's, uh, that's being used in most of those cases, and I'm, talking a bit in abstract, obviously, um, is actually using some amount of hyperbole, uh, using a specific narrative to amplify a message. And you can see this with activists as well, by mm. the way, because I've spoken with a bunch of people from uh, Greenpeace, from all sorts of NGO organizations, etc., that, that are doing, let's say, uh, green endeavors, etc. We had a few podcasts even recently. Um, there was a lady that was talking about uh, uh, CO2 emissions, etc. Um, and it's interesting because they use horribly strong words in, in some of those cases. And, you know, when, when you go down that road with them and start discussing, you, you can see that they backtracked as well. I mean, they backtrack up to a point of normality where you can have an adequate conversation about the issue, about the the measures, about the type of stuff that's actually possible, what's, what's you know, boots on the ground, what, what's going to happen, what, what are we going to do? And it's not the stuff that, again, they proclaim in the initial communication. I mean, the stuff that you see in media isn't this. Uh, I mean... It isn't the nuanced version. But that's so. My sorry, point is, yeah. uh, my point is, this uh, method is obviously useful. I mean, it could be useful in all of those cases. It oh, could yeah. be useful to to be a jerk. It could be useful to get a big audience. It could be useful to do some work specifically in some kind of activism. And that's the that's the uh, gray area for me. So how do we use this? pretty fucking useful tool well well that's uh, i mean that's part of the you're right the intention of the hyperbole is an important thing hmm. like you know uh, louise who was on yesterday you know at the, yeah. at, the, at the event you know she's she's done stuff with extinction rebellion and uh you know and sometimes you also see stuff that just stop oil does hmm. and it they're, they're they're big events that will shock people and they will hmm. you know the, these kind of moments where was was it uh van gogh's flowers i can't remember there was a hmm. flower painting that had soup thrown on it it had glass in front of it it did no damage um and that got a lot of attention hmm. I don't think those people involved in those campaigns that their main issue is to make sure that every painting in the world has soup on it, much as it would make some paintings so delicious uh, for a limited amount of time, obviously before the soup went off. But the uh, but it got attention, so mm -hmm. I don't see anything wrong with going. But it's then why are you using the hyperbole? So you know, it's a very uh, there's a lot of stuff uh, unfortunately people will very often go i mean i'm as much you know interested in making sure the world's safer you know uh with the accelerated rate of climate change but i do feel that throwing soup on a painting was too far and you go this is the kind of mealy mouthness that i think is too mealy mouthed i think every social change that that we see you know the suffragettes in england in the united kingdom uh you know they blew up the prime minister's house 
They put a bomb in it. Right, so that now we just see them as there were some wonderful women. They wore hats and purple and green, and the, and sometimes they chained themselves to things, yeah. but they never. And you go actually within the suffragette movement, there was a lot of debate between those who really wanted radical action because they knew no one was listening. So, so there's a, that, that point of you go, why do you want people to hear? Do you just want people to hear for your ego? Do you just want people to hear because you're trying to dehumanize mm -hmm. a whole group of people and it's politically useful? Do you want people to hear because the the world is genuinely, you know, the, these problems that it's facing are enormous mm. and we've seen a tremendous amount of inactivity across governments. We've seen a lot of talk. We've not. So I think all of that, but you're right, there's, you know, the, unfortunately to cut through, reason does not work. Mm. Reason is useful to have and vital, I think, underneath it all. But you have to do something sometimes quite explosive to get that. In the same way as we were talking the other day with, with climate change, one of the things is, a, uh, I think scientists have still believed that surely if they've seen the statistics, and the statistics are, don't do anything. It's, it's a, the, the, you, I'm sure you'd have seen it. There was a, a National Geographic piece about 10 years ago um, about the, the anti-science movement and a lot yeah. of the money that was coming from the fossil fuel companies into, a, you know, it's that great book, Merchants of Doubt, which kind mm. of compares how the tobacco manufacturers used scientific speakers in the same way that the oil companies have mm. to to manipulate some have, of the the evidence have you seen thank you for smoking which one, oh yeah which one which one's that that's uh, well it's from like more than 10 years ago at this point it was a um not a documentary obviously but it, it was again a, a narrative but it was fucking lovely about uh, um tobacco sales guy and the way that he pitches basically selling tobacco it was insanely good it was really i'll good. have a look at that it's really lovely sorry no but it's yeah so, so it's that bit of working out how uh to get that message across mm -hmm. and the national geographic there was a, a climate change a woman who'd been involved i think i think it was in a lot of kind of surveys on the arctic and she said it was really weird my dad didn't believe there was accelerated climate change. Didn't, mm. didn't, didn't believe in, in, in that. And I would say, Dad, what, what are you doing? No, but this is happening and this is happening. And, and he'd go, no, I read this guy and he said this. And I read, and she said, I couldn't believe it. I kept showing him these things that I'd found out from my research. Mm. And it was just, no. And he said, and she said, and then one day I just said, Dad, I can't, I find it really weird that you believe all of these men that you've never met, you don't really know about, but you don't trust your own daughter. And that was the bit that cut through, was he hmm. suddenly went, oh yeah, you're my, you're my daughter and you're doing this work and I'm kind of dead. So it was the emotional hmm. story hmm. that was hmm. it. And, and I think that's the bit which unfortunately means that if you do have a status quo, which seems to be in, in no way really paying attention to what are properly some of the biggest, you know, it, it's like with every issue, isn't it? Where you think about how many people does it affect? How many people will it affect? What are the ramifications of this? for the largest number of it so it becomes quite pragmatic doesn't it mm. It becomes kind of quite utilitarian i think in the in, in the way that you look at those things but yeah i'm not against hyperbole it, it's like but it's that bit where you go this is only hyperbole this has no so i think it's yeah again you have to look under each layer why why it's, it's like we have to work out all the time we should always be thinking why do i believe what i believe hmm. and once you're open to that like, you know, the older I get, the more I've believed in some things which are absolute nonsense. I've never questioned them. Uh, there may be things that I believe in now that are absolute nonsense. It's almost uh, a given. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be. <laughs> but it's that bit that the moment that you are someone who is scrutinizing yourself, you, you're already moving on. Yeah. And you're already going, I'm waiting to find out how this again what, what i was saying in the in the talk yesterday you know hold on to your beliefs with the, with a loose you know i used to i think in terms of atheism i used to be more kind of snide i think mm. now i don't really care at all one because i don't think being an atheist specifically has a is is an ideology that affects how i view yeah. the world yeah. yeah it's more of a lack of yeah and it's it's just it's not there so i never wake up in the morning and think 
what would not God do? That's not how you know. I don't have to think about that. You know, what would Richard Dawkins do? I'm not. I'm not that's not in my in my kind of ideology. Um, and that realization over time as well that what you know, I, I I think in the atheist movement there are still lots of people and some of the comics that bang on about atheism. Mm. They basically call they see all religious people as going. There's an old man with a big beard and he invented everything and I want there to be a heaven. And and they kind of say that that's why people believe. Now actually a lot of the people that I know who have religious religious belief have faith uh, one they've actually got more doubt than i've than i've got you know there's mm. bishops that i know who are constantly wrestling with the problems of what it is to believe mm. whereas i actually yeah there's a whole area of wrestling that i don't have to get involved in which of course allows me more time to actually watch wrestling uh and and then there's that bit which is that I was talking. I don't think you were in the car. I, I, I was talking with Roberto last night about Carlos Frank, who's this fantastic yeah. cosmologist in Durham. And Carlos, I wrote about him in, in 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 one of my books, which is I was really surprised when it turned out he believed in God hmm. because I just didn't really think it was kind of you know on the. And and I rang him up and I said, D "Are you talking about kind of the way that uh, you know Einstein talked about God, or the way that Stephen Hawking would talk about God?" And he said, "No, I, I believe in God." And then we had a very long discussion about it and one of the things that i'd increasingly started to learn was for someone like carlos i think god exists predominantly in an emotional part of the brain hmm. and obviously i'm talking in a very crass way but you know mm. what i mean it's kind of it's it's in that so the example i'll always use is if i go up to the mountains today after we've done this uh and i stand on top of the mountains and i suddenly i look out and i get that transcendent moment and almost my thoughts stop for a moment and there's just that you're immersed in wonder mm. and the delight of, of, of geology and possibilities and the clouds and all of those things. That doesn't then get converted into God. Mm. But I think for some people, there's an emotional experience, which is, and so God is, is not this physical being that some people, do, and, and starting to realise that, you know, if we just get go, oh, it's stupid believing in God. You know, well, first of all, Believing in God is not a single single thing. Hmm. You know, if, if, if someone says, I believe in God, and we go, oh, okay, that's done. It's a bit like when I was talking about, you know, with, with, with Brian Cox, when he, uh, if I say, you know, uh, ghosts really exist, and he'll say, no, they don't, they break the second law of thermodynamics, then he's not joining in the really interesting conversation. Yeah. Because the really interesting conversation is the why of believing in ghosts, is the sensation when someone believes they've had some kind of mm. experience like that. That's where the richness is, not... Mm in this cannot exist and the experiences i mean as as far as um, i've spoken to people are genuine i mean uh, none of the experiences of uh, whatever you call it grace or some kind of uh, moment or uh, you know fulfillment from from some kind of a almost otherworldly sources i mean the, the feeling that people actually get from this are genuine and I don't know, with, with time, I'm getting more comfortable with people having two sets of cards, mm. you know, I mean, you can be a physicist, but, you know, go to mass and, you know, just, just do uh, not only just culturally, which I think is absolutely legitimate, but also in, in a way that uh, contradicts some amounts of your beliefs. And you can even acknowledge this. I mean, you, you may know that two things are not compatible, but still believe in them. And I think uh, because in the past um, probably more than six years at this point, we have, um, we have regular discussions with a philosopher, uh, Stian Stavro, who is an amazing person, by the way. I love him dearly. He's crazy. Um, we've, we've spoken about contradictions a lot. And that contradictions are something that's very humane and it's... Uh, no. it's a good definition for uh, what a healthy human being is. Uh, being able to uh, hold different uh, ideas in your brain, some of which are contradictory, we think is kind of useful, both aesthetically, both in terms of like inner peace, etc. If you try to um, unravel everything and you know, have it perfectly balanced and rational, that's not a great life. That's not that's not the end goal of this whole endeavor. I mean, for example, we don't do science events and communication so as to get there. We we do not 
we do not need perfect reason because some of the stuff isn't controlled by reason and you know there's a there's a place for one thing and there's and it's useful and productive in one thing but not for everything well that's what carlos frank said when carlos said that he believed in god he said i believe in god but i don't allow him into the laboratory now that you know that so mm. so, so there is that you know for him it's very important that god kind of starts but when i say start the universe it doesn't get involved in the physics of the universe there's something but that spark is not the you know the scientific answer but that bit and, and the same way jocelyn bell Bonnell, you know who discovered pulsars and when i talked to her about this she said yeah you know, i i said is there ever a point she's a quaker and and, and i said is, has there ever been a moment of kind of where there's been a real battle between the science and 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 then being a quaker and she said not really she said every time a new piece of science has come along that might contradict some of the beliefs i've always had to tell my my beliefs to just shift over a bit further in the bed so it doesn't go both ways you know it's never like <laughs> i found out a new scientific idea but my being a quaker has shoved that you know back onto the yeah. floor and i think that's a very healthy thing as well which mm. is and you're right that there's i don't think anyone really lives well first of all if you live truly rationally of course you can't make a decision as, as we know people who've had yes. you know damage to the emotional uh, parts of their brain and, and they're no longer able to to really express or use their emotions it makes it very difficult it's what we see in i've seen various programs in terms of uh robot, ro robotic programming and i remember talking to someone about a program that was basically to prevent someone falling down a hole Hmm. And they said, you know, they made this system and basically it, it, it would work if the person was walking towards the hole, then uh, the robot system would move forward and prevent them falling down the hole. Hmm. But if you placed two people walking towards a hole, the robot was unable to do anything whatsoever. So you end up with two people in a hole because that emotional, you know, thing, yeah. which is, again, you know, we almost get to the trolley problem there and hmm. those kind of hmm. ideas. But so, so we know that our decisions, our emotional decisions... Hmm. And, uh, you know, and, and we know that some of the things, you know, it, it's again, it's that bit of being, I always use the example, it's one of my favourite things, I almost wish I'd talked about it yesterday, there's a lot of things I wish I'd talked about yesterday, because there's always other ideas, but uh, my, my, my friend John Higgs wrote this book about the poet William Blake, the poet and artist mm. William Blake, and um, my favourite story, or certainly one of my favourite stories, it's a very interesting book, it's called, called William Blake versus the World, and it's also about neuroscience, it's about imagination, it's about aphantasia, which I'd never known about mm. this, you know, this thing where some people don't have uh, a, a visual imagination. Mm. So if, if you say apple to them, they don't see an apple in their head, they don't, you know, and, and mm. sometimes those people are artists, which kind of, but anyway, that's another thing. So, um, you know, the way that William Blake was able to see different realities in the world, some he would know were collective realities that were generally experienced by everyone. Hmm. But there was another level of reality that he would experience, which was reality, but which was his personal reality. And he didn't need to tell everyone else that, that can't you see this? Because he knew they couldn't. And because it wasn't that for them. So yeah. the, the example John uses is one day D William Blake was very, very energetically arguing with a thistle because the thistle had become an old man that he was disagreeing with. And it really was an old man, but only for him. Now that, to me, has a level of complexity. Because yeah. the trouble is that once we have certain bits of our reality, you know, it's like the old colour thing, the blue, you know, the gold-green dress. No, it's gold. No, it's green. You know, that bit, we go, it doesn't matter. And it is a great example of, well, some bits of our reality are more personal than others mm. as long as we're obeying the laws of physics which will you know difficult uh, not to yeah that, but that bit where we decide that we can go against the laws of physics and we can fly out of the window as we know that's th those things are important mm. it's important to know that you can't stop believing in the bus that is going towards you as you're standing in the middle of the road <laughs> that bus will i mean of course you might actually be imagining the bus but more often you know what always presume the bus you're imagining is real, is real. that's a <laughs> useful thing to do but on other levels that that you know and, and i think that's one of the battles we have which is once someone has a belief about the way the world is very often they want to, to insist that everyone else believes in that too that's hmm. when we see faith becoming dogma that's when we see you know politics becoming dogma that's when we hmm. see you know all of those things this is why you know i remember years ago talking to richard dawkins and saying that i felt the problem with the, the during the kind of atheist boom you know of the, the early part of this century was i didn't think i thought it would be more useful if we didn't say religion if we said dogma 
Hmm. Because then, first of all, you can't go, oh, yeah, well, what about communism, Stalinism, blah, blah, blah. You go, right, with Stalinism, that's included in dogma. All definite beliefs, which mean that you cannot believe something that counters it, are unhelpful because that's where science gets its hmm. problems. That's where the point where you go... I think yesterday with uh, someone we were talking about, Fred Hoyle. You know, Fred Hoyle, who coined the, you know, Big Bang, which he coined as a ridiculous thing because he thought it was such a ridiculous idea that the idea that the universe would kind of have a beginning, that it would come from from what appears to, you know, the old line, uh, nothing but nothing with a lot of potential. And, and then expand. And, and it just wasn't, it was too much. And he didn't like that idea. Um, someone said to me one of the reasons that they believe he didn't go with that idea and why he was so kind of, you know, really committed to get the, against the Big Bang was because ultimately it affected him emotionally. Hmm. Because if the universe had a beginning, the universe has an end. And that was, and I know there are other, I'm trying to think of the other scientists, 1930s, who the one thing that he couldn't believe, he didn't believe in God, he didn't believe in any religion whatsoever, but he found it very hard to believe the universe would come to an end because then everything became pointless. Hmm. Which is kind of interesting because, to me, death, there, there's the pointless bit. Hmm? But for hmm. him, death was fine. But the idea that all of the work that human beings had done to understand the universe would eventually be pointless because the universe itself stopped existing, that was overwhelming and that was problematic. So those kind of, I think that was Dirac actually, I might be wrong, but I think it was Dirac. Um, so those things to me, are, are, you know, that, that bit of going that even these great scientists, there are points where emotionally, even if they wish to say, oh, it's not the emotional reason, it's because of this, that mm -hmm. and the other, underneath it all sometimes it is, this is just too much end of the day we we are all human but it's interesting what you're saying about um specifically about death because most of at least in in the ways that i've had these conversations usually death is what gives life meaning yeah uh so in the sense that the death of the universe would make the universe meaningful Or rather, if there's just uh, the so-called heat death of the universe, where everything just flies out into oblivion forever, f forever and ever. I think that's a much worse case than just the universe contracting the loop yeah. and being destroyed in a blink. I mean, um, having uh, a period of time where, you know, stuff matters, you know, that your actions matter, um, your attention and your priorities matter uh, and knowing that this will matter for a specific amount of time i think this this is as close as we're getting to meaning at least from my point of view uh that's as close as possible to having some reason to live imagine living forever oh yeah it's, it's one of the things that I, I i i said that in in the importance of being interested i said forever is too long yeah I, i'd like to have longer Because there's so much mm -hmm. stuff that I'd like to do, but oh, yeah. forever is definitely longer than required. That, and and yeah. you're right, once you lose, you know, one of the things that is driving us all the time is, you know, the reason that I came to Bulgaria, the reason that I'm then going straight off to do another kind of like I'm doing a horror movie thing, the reason that I say yes to so many things is I want to fill myself up with as many experiences as possible because mm. I know that it's over. There's, mm. a, there's a point where me stops being me. Exactly. And I'm gone. And I, and I think it's an, an important thing to, to you know, f feel feel that all the time is, is to, to go, right, I need to do stuff today. Hmm. Not out of desperation, out of the joy of going, today is the day that the purple that uh, I can see is a day that I experience that purple. And the zebra head that is sticking out of that wall above <laughs> you, right, I'm experiencing that. There will be a point where I stop hearing anything, seeing anything, doing anything, yeah. being anything. And that's the interesting thing about the universe as well. The end of the universe, when I'm my, like, I was really fascinated by this one. I think I was doing a thing with Katie Mack about her book, End of Everything. Hmm. And it's the idea that when the universe has expanded so much, that it's just, you know, there's, there's no form mm -hmm. left to it. It's just this incredible, it's just, you know, that, I mean, barely even in particles. It's just, you know, these mm -hmm. are just, that does time exist? Because it kind of is the end of the universe, even though you might go, mm -hmm. there's a thing there. But if, a thi if nothing is happening, mm -hmm. then there's no time. Because you need events 
for there to be time. Mm-hmm. And if there are no events. And I found that philosophically a very interesting, because that was the first, my first, what I'd call cosmological vertigo, which is a phrase mm. that I love. I think I first heard from The Short History of Progress by Ronald Wright. It, it, they were talking about Gauguin, that uh, mm-hmm. it, one of his one of the reasons that he, he went off to Tahiti was not merely because uh, of uh, his particularly unpleasant sexual uh, desires, but uh, not, not so keen on his work anymore. Um, but because he found the European world of thought and what it was discovering, Darwin's ideas and natural selection and all of this stuff, it was overwhelming. Hmm. And it gave him cosmological vertigo. And so he, he needed to run away from it to a society, which, of course, as it turns out, did not actually exist. He painted that society, but it's, it was a fiction. And I think cosmological vertigo, the first time I experienced it was, I remember just standing there and suddenly thinking about what if there was no beginning to the universe? Hmm. What if there's no start time? I, I didn't think about this com- you know, in any complexity. Mm. I was probably eight or nine years old. It might have been something I saw on a science fiction show, whatever it was. And that, and it would make me feel weird because the, the, you just keep going back and back and mm. back and back. And in that same way, when you first start really thinking about the size of the universe and it's so big and you shrink and you shrink and you shrink and the universe is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and you see that little figure of yourself in there and it's like, whoa, and you almost do. You lose your balance a little bit because it's so overwhelming. And I think that's a very important thing as well. I think it's important to be overwhelmed i think it's important to have moments where the 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 problem is that when we're overwhelmed if we wish to then get rid of that narrative so we're Mm. never overwhelmed again you should be overwhelmed by it's such a preposterous to me an absurd idea absurdity is something that i love so i like Camus more than sartre because i like absurdity and and i think how absurd is it that from something originally that was so 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 small we see it as non-existent that it expands and then stuff starts happening and suddenly you then and then eventually you have stars and then you have planets and then on at least so far as we know one planet you know that we also find out in the universe then chemistry comes along and then somewhere along the line of chemistry on this planet chemistry leads on to biology and now we're sat here talking to each other, or maybe we're not. Maybe we're a Boltzmann brain. Maybe this is yes, a split second yes. of existence. But all of the, I think many of the grand at least ideas. I am a Boltzmann brain. Just saying. Yeah. No, no, no. But you see, I no, I'm the Boltzmann brain, and this is where the Boltzmann brain. Yeah. So I apologise for your lack of existence, uh, but just so you know, neither of us will exist. In oh, there we go. Uh, but I think the thing to be, many people will get daunted by those ideas. I think they should be daunting, but then you should go. I can play with them. Hmm. Because also the size of the universe is of very little importance. Hmm. The really big issues of what is going to happen really within the 100 metres around us, within hmm. the 100 miles around us, within yeah. on, the, on the planet Earth, everything else is, is there to play with. Is, is not, you know, there are so many more things to be frightened of and to be scared of. It's um, funny you should mention uh, time earlier about, you know, the arrow of time, about entropy, etc. And that this giving you said vertigo. Um, for me, it was actually the block universe, and that that actually kind of fucked me up for a few years. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting because normally people find it as a as a compensation. Hmm. So, what was it that, that that kind of screwed you up with the the block universe? A few things. I mean, uh, first at, at that point, I've already studied some amount of physics, but it just didn't. I didn't connect the dog. It didn't click at any given moment because I uh, we studied Einstein in um, in first course in the physics faculty. Uh, before that, I was mostly my, my background was mostly in the humanities. So I mean, I read some amount of philosophy, etc. So at no point did I uh, connect physics with implications or on determinism, etc. Free will, the whole shebang, the whole shit show. Um, so at one point, I was, I don't know, the, the, I actually remember the night when I was just thinking about this. I was just thinking about, um, you know, looking at the universe from the vantage point of somebody outside the universe and how it's all immutable and immovable and it's exactly like this and there's no options for it to be another way, hence no um Degrees of freedom for for the um, beat particles or humans or whatever inside, and I'm just I perfectly remember the moment, and I'm like, fuck. So it was the free will issue, basically. Was yes. the now you see Faye Dowker, 
You know Faye, don't you? Yeah. Come across, right? She is, uh, f- and I, I won't be able to explain this again, so this is one of my I don't knows. This mm-hmm. is one of those things that I understood as she told me, but has then kind of hovered around my brain and drifted out of my ears at some point. Mm. But she is of the, the block universe where what is behind is now solidified, but what lays it, lies in front as we move into it still allows for choice. Hmm. Now, whereas other people I know basically go, the block universe just exists in it. And that, that's mm-hmm. kind of what I, that it's just there. It's this one solid and we're walking and moving into events that are basically mm-hmm. there already. Yeah. But she has a, a view of the block universe where the, the, the behind of the block universe is now solidified. That Those moments are in amber, but the moments ahead still hmm. have a variety. I mean, I always think the free will thing, I thought David Eagleman was very good on his, his the brain show where he showed the kind of, that there is a limit still of a certain amount of free will, though the, but is, it's an illusion that we're, if it is an illusion, it's one that it doesn't change, it shouldn't change you, hmm. the anxiety of it, uh, if it is a reality. Because mm. we we just have to accept that we if we're living this delusion, there's no other way of living it, and we can mm. just pretend that every day we're making the, the the decision and everything that I've just you know the idea that I mean per, one of the things I would say is that I reckon if the block universe everything there was no free will and everything was really solidified, I think the answer that I just gave would have been better because it was going to live forever, and if it had already kind of formed and I already knew that answer was going to happen, I think it should have been more clear. <laughs> As um, when I say I had some amount of anxiety, it's it actually was really useful uh, because it it didn't you know it didn't prevent me from being interested in 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 the topic I read profusely, um, so it it was useful because you get introduced to a bunch of different schools of thought and different ways of uh, approaching this. Um, including like people like Sam Harris, who is a you know non-compatibilist. Including people like Daniel Dennett, uh, um, a bunch of different ideas of how to define free will, for example. A bunch of different approaches to uh, whether we should integrate physics into our everyday um, discussions about choice maybe there's a kind of separate magisteria you know maybe you shouldn't talk about particles when you say whether you'd like to buy a cup of coffee maybe those are different conversations to have and it's interesting uh the the places that you go going from this uh, fundamental anxiety about the universe then going to the mundane and from the mundane, actually getting some amount of um, ease. Not not necessarily something that makes you um, comfortable with the idea or g- gives you a resolution, but basically brings you back to, <laughs> to planet Earth and makes you not... Um, makes you not just being an absolute reductionist mm. about uh, the little you know of physics, yeah. if you know what I mean. Well, I, I mean, yeah. the, the ultimate thing is that you want to get as much kind of education, knowledge, ideas, etc., to live your life in a way that is as satisfactory for as you, for you and as many people around you as possible. And yeah. that, that to me is, and, and that's, and I think that is why it is worth approaching a lot of these ideas, because I, I would agree with you in terms of some of the ideas that I found truly baffling and some of them that I still find truly baffling. And some of the ones that I found really deeply disconcerting that, I think I, certainly in the last few years, each step has been, you know, is like I'm in a better place than I was before. And that's, mm. you know, it's, what's it, that whole, you know, living is learning how to die or whatever it was, Plato, Socrates, one of those ones. Yeah, but, but that bit of just going, this bit of, like there was a poem that I wrote that started off, uh, I am disorder, you are entropy. We're a phase of the heat death of the universe made of what might seem eternal, but is probably finite, especially when it's gathered up as us. We're up quarks and down quarks, charm quarks and strange quarks, maybe not, but definitely strange. And it was like, it went on like that. And quite often when I've kind of turned things, the, the poetry, one of the purposes, apart from giving a pause for people when I'm rambling on at incredible speed in the show, is also it helps me by, because I have to refine it into a certain number of words. Hmm. So I had no Damascene moment of thinking about what it is to know that you are something which is what happens as disorder increases. 
But I know that there's something inside me that is like, this is really fascinating. This is kind of a cool yeah. way of going, this is how we've, we've come up in the universe. So, so I think that, and I, and I think that's the bit which is, to because I think we mentioned there's that great book, When We Cease to Understand. I can't mm. remember if you've read it. It's, it's, no, I haven't. But, but it's got, you know, that's a very it. interesting book because it's a series of, of, of stories of, of, of real mathematicians, scientists, and others, the point in which it became so daunting. Yeah, you know, it's a bit like some of the mathematicians that we know took their own lives, and mm. it was like there was a the, the necessity of order. It mm. seems to me for some of them, and then the unavailability of that order is what became to they they wanted to live in a world that was entirely mathematical for some of them, mm. um, and so it's finding that balance of saying what gives me the 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 richest experience. Um, without always making me fall over in the middle of the street by just the weight of, of these ideas. Something that, um, um, I mean, I, I've noticed in the way that you talk, talk about stuff in general. So you literally just quoted a poem. <laughs> you, you quote people that are sometimes artists, or at least with an artistic side or some kind of uh, narrative, etc. Uh, so it seems to me that you are integrating art a lot mm. and in and, and talking about uh, science in general and it's something which I um, resonate a lot as well because we are trying to integrate art into the stuff that we do in the events that we do we, we try to integrate visually <laughs> Uh, in terms of like a soundscape even we we want to have have it out we even um, with our team we're trying to do this further we're trying to do collaborations with artists so we can communicate better but how do you do it i mean how do you manage to integrate it because f for us it's still really fucking difficult <laughs> it's really difficult to actually use art so as to communicate something and not make it bullshit not make it mm. just just pretty just aesthetics so how do you maintain the content uh And basically use the art to communicate the content better so that people um, retain some information or, uh, you know, get more interested in the stuff that you're talking about rather than just uh, dumbing it down and making it pretty. Well, I think there is that bit that once when you've got a visual reminder of an idea, like once you know, for instance, that some of the ideas like cubism, mm. cubism, partly comes from quantum mechanics. It partly comes from some of those artists were reading uh, about this kind of the nature of matter and the nature of, you know, what made mm. it. And, and, and so suddenly you get these fantastic, you know, Duchamp and others who are not creating an image of you as you are, but they're creating this kind of layered image and this kind of broken sequence. And that means that then if we can make sure that people start to i mean i think one of the biggest problems i forget the name of the german uh um intellectual who came up with the curriculum system which is now the dominant system mm. of, of education and of course for me one of the huge problems with that is that it means yeah. that each subject is a separate subject and you know you know with geography to me it's a fascinating thing that you start to understand how politics and history are, mi are mixed in geography you know there's that great research that was done about you know why were the certain patches in the american south which were democrat when everywhere else was republican uh, in terms of voting and then you find out if sometimes it's about the different seams of what was there the different soil that was there it's mm. about the fact that that was very rich cotton growing soil so it meant there were a lot of slaves there so now that is where you have the afro American voting block in and it's specific to that bit mm. of soil and that bit of rock and all of those things so that means that's not just geography is not just the story of geography geography is the story of politics geography is the story of history mm. you know physics is, is is not just the story of physics physics is the story of literature Physi all of these things are, are mixing up so I think that's one of the first ways to mix it is to not see How do we, you know, the moment you go, this is art and it is separate and this mm -hmm. is science, how do we meet it? Then you've already created a kind of wall around mm -hmm. it, I think. That bit that the first time you start to get knowledge of how art can be a reaction or sometimes art is an exploration of what science is not able to explore yet because we don't have the technology. So, yeah. you know, there's. A, I, I remember Douglas Adams talking about why he stopped reading books of fiction. Um, and he said it was because he saw a lot of fiction was looking at ideas that we didn't have the ability to look at scientifically yet. 
so in terms of looking at psychology and things like that and then we reach a point where we can actually now do it in a non-fiction way mm. I disagree with creating that because I still find I went through a long period of not reading many much fiction and now I read a lot of fiction because I think it really does inform how we see the world so I think the first thing is like I talked about that Turner painting yesterday is science is about seeing the world and art is about seeing the world and great artists and great scientists and average artists and average scientists are very often they're trying to work out what it is to be alive to have consciousness mm. to be in this universe so once you you see that as it starts rather than that they start as two separate subjects they start as an issue based something that comes from the same desire but with slightly different, you know, the si the difference is that the scientist has to eventually you you have to it has to be proved to be accurate. Mm. Art, the accuracy of art, is I suppose in the experience of the beauty of the art or the experience of the questions that come from the art. So I think that's one of the things is you you start with it coming from the same seed, not from being two separate seeds that you're then huh. trying to cross pollinate. That's an interesting take. That's an interesting take. I mean, uh, yeah, obviously science and art have the difference in in the objective and the subjective and art has maybe a different kind of um different kind of stake into the whole thing it's 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 mostly at least in my read of the whole thing it's mostly uh, a, a communication you know art is trying to you know trying to communicate from the artist to the person that's reading it or looking at the picture whatever well science isn't exactly this science is but i think what they're both doing is they're both trying to create connections so if you see it as a connective thing hmm. so when the scientist is explaining an idea of the universe when the scientist is explaining the entropy when the scientist is explaining natural selection right this then creates all of those connections so we get that connection from the tree of life you know you suddenly realize we go back this far and that's the last time that we share an ancestor with an octopus and we go back that far and that's the last time we share an ancestor with moss and we go back that far so to me i see most of it as as a as a connection so one of, one of the things that i think is very useful is sometimes what happens is science just goes make some some art out of our science right and i think it needs to be yeah. a, a back and forth so that's, my friend that's... natalie k thatcher who um uh, illustrated the the last book that i did she did this great event a few years ago where she became really fascinated but she did a wonderful book called how to build a Feynman, which is a beautiful little cartoon book just about the, the story of richard Feynman, very beautifully done she also did another one which is the the universe in a glass of wine do you know this it's it's this wonderful no. i i wish i knew it off by heart but it's uh richard Feynman talking about what you can see in a glass of wine yeah and it, much like the kind of the story of the flower it's taking it bit yeah. by bit down by down down to atom yeah. summer and, and then and then at the end of it he says and then what we finally do is we drink the wine so it's like all of the questions all of the yeah. ideas but then the sensory experience of drinking the wine and uh, and she did a, a thing called jiggling atoms mm -hmm. which was mixing what she did was first of all she introduced artists to loads of different ideas of, of, of physics and then she wanted to see how they how they would interpret that because that's mm. what an artist wants to do so what, what yeah. you're actually doing is you're giving them more subjects yeah you know, so that's the great thing you know mm. which, which, which is you know you go you don't just have to paint the hill uh let me tell you something that lies within the hill let me tell you something that lies with in the rocks in the hill. Let me tell you. So, so you're just giving more subject matter. And you're saying now interpret that. And then what she would do is people would come to the exhibition and they'd look at certain paintings, certain kind of sculptures, etc. And then there'd also be a conversation. Sometimes it would say me with John Butterworth, the physicist John Butterworth used to work mm. at CERN. And we would talk about what that particular vision was giving to the audience because equations if you put a big equation on the wall and you stare at it for as long as possible right that's not going to make you 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 have to if you then stare at one of the things that equation means in terms yeah. of the universe in terms of our experience then it becomes tactile Although, and so i think that's it cape farewell used to do this very well cape farewell i don't know if you know about cape farewell this no. was this was um taking artists and scientists to areas of the world where you could clearly see the acceleration in climate change hmm. so sometimes it would be say a mollusk 
that had throughout the fossil record the shell had not changed for millions and millions and millions of years but in the last hundreds of years there had been rapid change in that shell to try and then deal with the change of, mm. in the in the water or it would be areas of landscape or whatever it might be and the scientists would explain to the artists you know what they were experiencing and then the artist would go away and create something. Sometimes it was someone like Jarvis Cocker from Pulp, so mm. he might write some songs, or Robin Hitchcock. Uh, or it might be, again, it might be a ceramicist or whatever. And I went to one of their events at the Botanical Garden in uh, in Edinburgh, and I was hosting some stuff, and it was great because someone had made all of these different statues of this mollusk, right? And again, they were tactile, and they were they were beautiful. And then someone would stand there, and they'd walk you, first of all, through the art of the mollusk that you were seeing and these different shapes and then they would walk you through what the story the story that was being told by that sculpture and the change in the form because the form had now become so big and so elaborate and then when the form was and suddenly that idea sticks even more you have seen something of beauty and you have heard something that may well be terrible as well the and context that, yeah and 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 so I, i think it's that bit where you actually you put the two groups in a room hmm. and they start talking absolutely agree absolutely agree and um some of the collaborations that we're doing right now it's by the way it's insanely fun i mean just listening to uh really really good neuroscientists or a chemist etc in the same room with somebody that has a narrative about something that they care about for example we're doing a, a pretty interesting case study slash experiment type of thing uh, where we explore memory so You look at those people together and they're like, oh, okay. So, I mean, there's, there's this cab driver is going to the woods. He's driving this uh, lady, whatever. I mean, there's this and this, there's this aroma of cigarettes in the car, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we start digging in to the whole thing and the neuroscientist starts asking questions. Uh, then the... Uh, the artist starts uh, wondering about well, how do we know that this works like this and it's a back and forth in ways of knowing that each of them has but they don't really work in the same sense together up a, up until that point mm. so it it's absolutely lovely i mean i spent probably this year more than 20 hours just listening to those guys in the same room and i'm like This is excellent. I enjoy my life greatly. <laughs> yeah, by the way, this is something that we will have uh, on the 5th of December. It's going to be the, the premiere is going to be there. Uh, so we will have it translated in English as well. So I'll show you and hope you like it. And Robin, it's absolutely fucking lovely that you decided to come after... 11 years yeah <laughs> of uh, i always wanted to i should yeah. say i wasn't i wasn't rejecting the invitation i was going ah oh, i'm going off to somewhere else i'm on tour with brian cox or i mean you know that that thing and that and again that's part of that bit of knowing that you know the death drive or whatever the hell it is uh I'm, i don't think i'm that much of a freudian but it's you know that bit of just going ah oh, ask me earlier ask every time i would always say that to you, i, I said yeah. get, tell me the moment you know that day and, and then we definitely and we got so close before but it, yeah. it was what was so great about being in that room was afterwards you know having conversations and as i said to you you know talking to some of the teenagers hmm. who are still you know they a lot of them i got the kind of sense of some of them you, you know that they're, they're finding their place hmm. as as yeah you know, and the fact that they wanted to come to somewhere to hear about squids and they wanted to hear about solar events and all of those things hmm. you know and you could see how happy they were afterwards of going yeah. this this is a place where we can hear these ideas and then we can converse with other people about these ideas and then we yeah. spread the ideas i think it was i think it was lovely and just for me again back to the ego because it's a me thing obviously um you were on my list of 10 people to invite to uh events before we started making events So just for me personally, this brings me great pleasure that you Good. decided to come. So thank you again. Thank you. 
And guys, thank you for watching, listening, or whatever kind of content you're using right now. Uh, if you'd like to see more of this content, uh, there's a few ways that uh, you can help out. One is you can suggest more topics, uh, speakers, some new ideas that we can potentially explore. You could do this uh, on Facebook, ratio.bg, or on Instagram, ratio.bg. Also, um, if you'd like to support us in more tangible ways, you can do it on ratio.bg support. Thank you.